We're now into segment two, which we're going to talk about how to host tabletop RPG games for children, creating a child-friendly environment. So we'll start with, uh, we're at uh, Lord Mattias here. What steps do you take to ensure the gaming environment is safe and comfortable for children? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put throw a, a couple of little not curveballs in here, but I want to be very clear. For somebody like me, safe just means that Johnny isn't punching Billy. But in the modern context, safe also means, hey, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say words, but because it, it's not just words, but words, it, how are feelings not being hurt? So just let's, because children are more sensitive to that in, in general. So keep that in consideration as well. So what steps do you take to ensure the gaming environment is safe and comfortable for children? Um, Okay. Yeah. I actually think I may have misunderstood the question when uh, I was sort of prepping. Um, I already mentioned that I, I, I would talk to parents who don't know me. Um, but with, in terms of the game, um, I told uh, everyone when we sat down on the very first session, I don't typically do session zero. Um, we rolled up characters and then we started playing. I told them, you know, it's okay if your character dies. That's part of the game. You know, and I have backup characters ready to go. So in the very next room of the dungeon, they'll find the, you know, cleric or the fighter or whatever uh, that'll join the party for the time being. And if they want to make a new character later, they can. Shadow Dark's got some nice uh, alternative uh, optional rules to make it more pulpy. Uh, such as luck dice, which um, allows uh, players to use a reroll by spending those luck dice. Uh, so when they really want something to succeed, you know, um, they can use that and get a get a chance. But um, I mean, I, I have a reputation being kind of mud core, so <laughs> I have to be. I, it's a real challenge sometimes because I'm like, eh, sorry, you know, but I do tap into that uh, Gary Gygax meme where I'll look at him and I'll like really look at him. I'll say, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> yeah. You know, and sometimes it means coaching them a little bit. And that's why I wanted to do a Dungeons and Dads game where dad could turn to their kid and go, well, I know you want to jump over this 25 foot chasm but you're a half lane, you know, <laughs> like, and kind of walk them through it. Um, with my son, when we were doing the uh, just so one-on-one, -on -one, I would have those kind of conversations. So how do you think that would work? I would ask him, you know, and, and just sort of work on the concept of like, you know, there's going to be consequences to what you're doing. So um, that's I when think... kids come up with dwarf tossing. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, so yeah, using things that get, get, allow them a second chance, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, that, I mean, there are bumpers like in a bumper bowling, but you can still get gutters when I run games, because I do think those consequences are important. I think that teaches something. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell you the very first, I think I mentioned it earlier, the very first game my son played, there were some tears cause he was just rolling so bad. I let him go and take care of his business. And then he came back finished the game and like i said the next day he got his revenge and he was rolling hot that night so um i also um shadow dark has carousing rules so you can get experience points for spending your gold getting drunk i took i took those out like we th those are just not available um and um i i'm playing with my friends who i've who are parents and I already know them and I trust them. Um, I do have a quick horror story though. The very first time I did this was, was another group of people that I kind of knew through a friend at work who plays and he invited me to be a game master and we were gaming for a while and not the greatest group, but you know, I was having fun and then they wanted to do this one shot with their kids. So I was like, cool. The adults were like worse than the kids like talking trash um and i'm just sitting there completely horrified and what they're doing and these poor kids are just like crestfallen because they thought they had these great characters and like these power gamers are like you know getting on them and i'm just like that was the beginning of the end wow my asso association with that group i was just like, i showed you up eight-year-old <laughs> yeah yeah it was it really was stuff like that God. um and I found myself playing like the like I felt like uh, I guess like a kindergarten teacher like no it's okay no no I really like your character it's cool and that spell use was very good you know then just and that's when I know we're not supposed to fudge dice but I was fudging like crazy with those parents <laughs> just so I could kill them but <laughs> but uh, I was not happy with them at all but anyway um, 
I, I'm my friends that I game with now who I trust, they know to let the kids take the lead and they're just there to guide. And, um, and they, like I said, they seem to be having fun. It's great. Keeps them involved as well. I, I like that. So they're not just standing on the side. Oh my God. When's my kid done with this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, I want to get a little bit more onto the, uh, <laughs> not to the negative side of this. Uh, so oh, I shouldn't call it negative, but preventing the negative. So how do you establish and communicate boundaries and rules with children, specifically at the start of the session? I reminded them that um, Dungeons and Dragons, generally speaking, is a team sport. Um, uh, you know, they have to work together to survive. Um and that if they don't, things are going to go badly for them. And that's why, again, why I'm, I don't pull punches when, you know, if you're down to zero hit points, you're dead. So far, that actually hasn't happened. They've gotten very lucky. <laughs> Something I, I remind them very frequently, in fact. Um, but I told them, yeah, this is this is a team sport. You're supposed to work together. Um, I did a couple of times have to look toward look at a player who wanted to, like, steal something from somebody, another player, and just say, are you sure that that would be appropriate to do to a member of your team? You know, um, and they, you know, backed off. Uh, but I, I do kind of uh, enforce that just a little bit more um, because the, the last thing you want is them um, pointing fingers and like, well, it's not fair. They were able to do that. You know, and he took my sword and, you know, I think you do need to, you know, Put that put your foot down but i do say in the beginning number one this is a team sport number two it's okay if your character dies you can you'll be able to make another one and um uh i do put up uh, a few bumpers you know okay. with the, the luck dice all right let's jump up to frank uh same main question for you what steps do you take to ensure the gaming environment is safe and comfortable for children uh, a, a lot of this is just basic logistics. Uh, we start, we go back again. Uh, the parents buy in, uh, inadvertently transmits to the kids. Um, like I said, uh, my, my wife was initially hesitant and then transferred, uh, you know, her, her okay, uh, her, her check mark uh, of approval, so to speak. And, and, and things progress from there. Uh, but you're talking like just general dynamics, like uh, like uh, an open area, um, uh, snacks, candy. You, you indicate how that works. Okay, uh, you know if you're, if you're going to be eating at the table, uh, make sure you're not interrupting with people's stuff in their dice. Um, don't eat the dice. Don't eat the dice. Uh, stuff like that. It's 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 more uh, you know well lit area. It's a common room or or you know friendly local gaming stores, uh, private room in the back, whatever the the case may be. Uh, and then you gotta you gotta start talking about some of those those session zero social interaction rules. And one of the good things about those kids is that at that age they're used to um, you know every Monday to Friday going to an institution that typically has a series of rules that they have to follow. So most of those are relatively in line with the kind of things that you're going to be talking about anyways. Um, but you, you get an idea of what they're playing and you try and template things to match personalities. Um, uh, or, or you just pre-gen a one-shot and, and go from there, give them the pre-generated characters. Um, but you, you have to give them a permission structure to fail and a permission structure to uh, collectively tackle the problem. Like what Mateus said, this is a team sport. Uh, if you try doing this as individuals, you're going to find yourselves, uh, regardless how well you're rolling your dice, uh, you know, when it's six against six and you make it six against one and you're the one, I, you know, the other five are just going to watch you flame and crash um, and, and, and probably in, enjoy the spectacle. Um, and, and then you're dealing with that fallout. So as long as you get an idea of uh, what what the you know no player versus character uh, interactions like you're not going to steal somebody's Johnny sword uh, or the, or the, the the wizard happened to grab the bag of gold okay well predetermine how that is going to get divvied before you carry on otherwise you're going to have that one dude that happens to be playing the rogue that decides to figure hey I saw this in a Disney movie I'm going to go and take my knife and cut it off his belt. Um, and, and then you got 
you got the bad feels. He's from one player. Another one is is not enjoying himself. Uh, and the other ones are just there going, this is okay? Or are we going to start backstabbing? So just make sure you understand what those rules of interaction, those social interaction rules uh, are laid out before you really get too far down the trace. What, uh, what techniques do you use to encourage a shy or hesitant child to participate a little more? A lot and, of talking, that, and I want to be clear, this is for the audience. I understand. I know you understand the question, but uh, just for the folks out there, this isn't about pressuring a child to do anything. This is literally encourage me. Yeah, a lot of that is um, you, you got to uh, this is where you almost have to become that, that school teacher where you got to try and draw Johnny out of his shell uh, and, and try and talk to him uh, or her about their character, what it is that they're doing in the scenario. And then um, if you have to draw, draw them out of character for a second and have that conversation with, you know, is this something that, that, that you understand and, and what do you think you would do in that scenario? And then let's apply that to your character. Your character actually has other options. Let's, you know, look at your skill list, look at your weapons or, or whatever it is that you're dealing with. Uh, and then, and then kind of throw them a bone. Uh, but this is particularly more difficult for something that isn't quite so um, obvious as, let's say, a fighter uh, or a combat class. Um, if you're dealing with like a rogue, somebody wants to play a rogue scholar, I, I wouldn't necessarily give that to a kid as a starting class. Um, but if you've got something that's more uh, esoteric, like, like uh, psychic powers, magic spells that can do all these weird and wacky things, um, you know, you, you might have to take a little bit of extra time to coach them into the idea to, to go, OK, well, actually, I can't do what everybody else is doing that seems to be drawing success. But my character has this ability that maybe nobody else has. Let's see what that does. And then um, gi give them give them some bonuses to throw something out there. Uh, weird and wacky. Let them. I, I know you hate this expression, Max, but let them throw on the clown shoes for a second. And just do something completely weird and wacky, and and see where it goes. Um, oh, for I, children, I'm all for it. It's it's when adults want to do that that I'm like, what? Absolutely. So, I mean, if they if they want to start all of a sudden pulling a maneuver with a skill that even you didn't think of, run with it and just see where it goes. And then uh, I'm all for theater of the mind approaches for making this more cinematic weave that in and make it a more pronounced part of the story at that time to start developing that person, that, that individual's comfort with their character and integration with the rest of the party with uh, who, who might already be perfectly capable of doing what they're doing with their character. It's just little Johnny and Susie. Uh, we got to get you involved. Let's, let's try something zany. Let's, let's throw it out there and then make it zany and make it impactful. Mm -hmm and then run with it from there. Okay, sounds good. All right, Nagahide. Uh, again, primary question, what steps do you take to ensure the gaming environment is safe and comfortable for children? All right, so I kind of took this question to mean something different uh, when I originally read through it. Uh, okay. But the, also, I also want to make a, a statement Based on something you said earlier when the segment started uh when it comes to feelings i find that adults get hurt feelings more than kids do during a game fair, fair. Just, just, just just my experience you know it's funny because um, chat is saying that a lot as well so you know <laughs> might be some truth to that uh but with that being said i, I kind of have a set of rules you could say like I won't run a game that has children players if the entire group of players aren't children or if they if their parents aren't involved. I won't I won't allow random adults to play in a game when I don't know that adult with any kids that I run a game for. If I have always found if there's an adult that a kid doesn't know, they're really hesitant to open up during any anything. It doesn't matter if it's a game or 
just sitting somewhere like they're not going to open up as much um so there's that and then i also if there are adults in the game that are parents of the kids or close family friends uh or, or what have you I also make it known to the adults that there won't be any lewd talk in the game or out of the game at the table. Like no cursing, no no descriptive violence or anything like that because I don't want any of the kids to feel uncomfortable in that way. Um, but to kind of give like an example of the game that I ran, uh, which I brought up earlier in segment one, uh, that risk game that I ran, uh, I ran it for my family. Uh, I was, you know, their first introduction to tabletop RPGs. And I set it during the New West. Uh, and essentially what I did there to kind of make it feel safe and comfortable is I based the entire game off of the old black and white Lone Ranger TV mm -hmm. show. So, like, my son, they didn't play the actual characters of Lone Ranger and Tonto, but my son was a gunslinger. Uh, my daughter played a dancer that hung out in the saloon, and then the third player played a uh, Native American Spirit West book. I don't remember which OCC it was. Uh, and then I just created a problem that was happening in the town and I had to like stop the the villains from robbing the train or or whatever it was um and then I kept everything tame just like the TV show and it yeah it was it was kind of um I don't know if you'd say clown shoes but cheesy definitely cheesy and I threw all all the cheesy one liners I could remember from the TV show you know so <laughs> Uh, so you kind of touched on this, but let's dive into it a little bit more. How do you handle those themes of damage and death and monsters that may be a bit sensitive for children? Uh, like I said, I don't go into the detail of it. Um, character death, if it happens, I try to let them know before we get to deep into the game that it's a possibility that that character might die but it's okay right um but like monster death i just say okay you defeated the monster i won't necessarily say that they killed the monster so right? it's kind of like tune where you fall down <laughs> right yeah right okay. exactly yeah uh, how has that not come up yet run tune for children <laughs> nobody uh, watches i did i did i I didn't have the book. My that's fair. I lost. I lost the book years ago. Well, let's be honest. I, I mean, Saturday morning cartoons aren't the same anymore, right? Right. That too. <laughs> so, uh, all right, uh, Nagahad. I sent a private uh, message uh, in the uh, in Streamyard, and then for everybody, because uh, we're we're gonna knock this last one out. I had one other here I wanted to ask. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Oh, I thought this one was an interesting one because it's a bit different. Now, what role does the physical setup of the gaming space play in creating a comfortable environment? I can throw something in there. I mean, uh, and, and this is just basic, uh, you know, interact, social interaction rules. Um, have everybody around the table, not you on one side and all the players on the other, because then it just naturally creates this dynamic where it's you against everybody else. So everybody is in a, you know, it doesn't have to be a round table, but I mean, everybody is on all four sides of the table. Um, and, and everyone is close enough that you're able to have that, that physical interaction. Like if you have to pass a dice from one person to the other, you're not pitching it the length of the table. Um, and and making sure that everybody has their supplies and their character sheets and all the rest of it handy and available to use, um, but not so much that again you, you you could lie down on the table in between everybody. Um, 
aside from that, it's it's really just making sure that it's uh, yeah again well lit. Uh, it's not you don't have a fan going and the air conditioner is up to the max because um, because that. There's nothing worse than a kid shivering or a kid sweating. That that's going to just drive them right out of the game. Again, yeah, uncomfortable outfit, kids let, let you, definitely right let now. you know that they're uncomfortable, right? <laughs> yes, they will. That that nonverbal cue, they'll they'll come into it and they'll tell you. Yeah, I'll. Uh, I, I actually, that's a great question. It's not something I actually really thought about. I may, I guess maybe it's sort of um, something to meditate on a little bit more because where we game is in my buddy's basement he's got like a pool table and then the gaming table but there's no tvs there's no that, that's what i was looking for like yeah, yeah. gotta keep the tv off gotta keep all the distractions away it, it is the gaming room that's where we game us adults when we go over there that's that's the gaming room um i i know some people have a problem with like snacks and stuff at the table when it's kids i don't care there's a big bowl of cookies by all means grab a cookie eat while you're rolling your dice and and telling me about what your character's doing while like cookie crumbs. You are just made, you're making my legs shake right now. Just <laughs> thinking about that for the people who don't know, I, I have misophonia. So listening to people eat makes me want to hurt people. And so, uh, yeah, not being around people, including children that do that is a benefit. <laughs> yeah. I just let, I, again, let them do it because it's, it, it's something they, they get their cookie, they're rolling their dice. They're seeing their dwarf fighter crush, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Basically um, let kids be kids, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so there's that. Um, though there is this thing I am gonna do, you know, if if we if we are able to continue with the, the keep on the Borderlands campaign, um, I am gonna stick to Theater of the Mind, but because they defeated the bandits, that means the merchants are gonna have an easier time getting to the keep. So I was going to do as part of the story to keep them, you know, to show that they've accomplished something, is actually I was going to draw out that entire map onto a battle mat and roll it out on the table. And in game, that's going to represent the Castellan of the keep offering the player or the characters a special spot in the inn where they can actually see this like table that's carved out like the borderlands so they can actually start keeping track of their accomplishments by carving into the table in which case i hand them a pen and they can write all over it so that's that's something i'm planning on doing that i guess sort of a, a, a goes to your question about using the space mm -hmm. um and hope and maybe turn it into something kind of immersive as well and it'll have a lot of cookie crumbs on it i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> all right now hide anything you want to add to that or are we ready to move on uh, the only thing I was going to add is I, I started around the kitchen table, uh, both with my kids and with their friends when playing as they, as they got older, we moved to the living room where it was more comfortable and they could kind of, you know, sit where, however they wanted. But I, I started at the kitchen table so they could try and maintain their focus longer. Okay. All right, well, let's read some chat and then uh, move on to the second question of this segment. What did I start here? Just a reminder for folks, uh, Super Chat's $20 and less will be read at the end of the segments. Uh, $20 or more will be read as immediately as I can, and $50 or more will make me drink. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I got that started for possibly later. Like I said, Crafty, I'll ask that question if we have time. Jack McCarthy says, for $5, thank you very much. I appreciate the $5 for the love of the game. Shout out to Lord Mattias. There we go, whose face is covered right now with the chat. <laughs> Take that, sir. <laughs> and then uh, talking about the death of monsters and so forth, Nerdy Ogre had a good one here. G.I. Joe, somehow even the most evil organization somehow has an ejection system for the pilots in the vehicles. go and that's all i share by the way i am reading most of the chat i'd like to say all of it but i don't think i'm getting all of it most of it you guys are crazy in the chat i appreciate that keep it going uh i am paying attention to it but i've got to keep the show going as well so uh all right let's get on to the next question here which looks like we're starting with not wait are we starting with naga hide no should be one two three no we're back up to to frank up there yeah, we're 
I, I do, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's my show. I'll start with whoever I want, but uh, <laughs> like, I'm trying to keep track. I'm trying to do the right thing, and I'm failing. All right. All right. So, right. How do you balance rules enforcement with flexibility to maintain fun and engagement for children? Starting with me or now? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, starting with you, sir. No, oh, okay. Um, yeah, Ridge's rules lawyering never kind of leads to fun. Uh, neither are blatant inconsistencies. Um, but I am very much uh, for the, the narrative theatrical approach to uh, dealing with uh, combat and, and interactions within the game space. Um, you got to be on the, be on the ready to do on the fly rulings. Kids are, are just in time practitioners to the extreme. Um, so when they get an idea, like they get an idea before you even finish saying the word squirrel and they are off and running before you even have an idea of what it is that they want to do. Um, which is fine. You got to roll with those punches and and lean towards giving a, a bonus versus a penalty, especially if they've got a zany idea that they want to try, obviously within certain limitations. Um, the rules for the setting and the rules for the system that you're using are a framework. Uh, and, and you have to be willing to provide a little bit of elasticity, plasticity to that framework to, to get things going. Um, so like in, in Palladium, you've got uh, uh, bonuses to strike, you've got your weapon proficiencies, you've got abilities, uh, and then you're firing on a, a moving target. It might be behind cover. There is at least six other pluses or minuses that I could think of within the Palladium framework that, that you could sit there and start calculating out to make sure you know exactly what it is that they need to roll to hit. Don't bother. Just pick a number. Pick a number that fits the setting. Pick pick a number that sets the theme of what's going on, uh, and and allows them the opportunity to go forward and do something uh, that that reinforces what they're trying to accomplish within the story. Uh, D twenty has things uh, like feats and disadvantages. Uh, if if you're going to go deep into it and really start calculating what squares on the grid are doing what. Uh, you're probably going to spend way too much time digging into the books to find out how the interactions of the different feats work. Just roll with it. Just do it. Um, and then in terms of the violence and uh, things that we talked about already, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars kind of uh, rules for violence where, um, yeah, you hit them, they go down, they fall down. They're done. You don't even have to say, like, they were defeated. Um Language choice is kind of dependent on what you, the personalities that you're dealing with. Uh, a lot of the times they could they can accept that, you know, you're saying the word dead. And in some cases, uh, that will not fly. Uh, that That's <laughs> something that will have to be determined by the personalities. And you got to sanitize certain themes. We touched on this earlier. I think it was Nagahai that mentioned it. There are certain themes that you either, uh, and Lord Mateus mentioned this as well, the carousing rules and stuff like that politics, religion, uh, drugs, and, 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 and sexual references, and those kind of things, certain games go deep into that rabbit hole. Um, I, I don't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult enough with adults, and there are conflicting <laughs> ways of looking at these, these topics. Uh, try dealing with parents who figure out that you're touching on those topics with their kids from a third hand account. So what uh, does a potion of heroism really mean, sir? That seems pretty close to liquid yeah, heroin. <laughs> that's right. No, it's, it's, and, and, and that's a conversation that you got to be ready to have. Um, but then uh, the last thing that I do is, is, uh, you know, in Palladium, there's that famous GI Joe armor concept, uh, where if you've got two MDC left and I hit you for 48 damage, uh, yeah, your armor just disappears. That, that's it. Now, now you don't have any armor. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not going to play with that extra damage just because I, I, I'm not there to vaporize you. That's just the way it happened. I'm, I'm not even going to tell you how much damage I did. I did enough to destroy your armor. Uh, you only had two MDC? Oh, okay. Uh, you're knocked to the ground and your MDC armor is useless. It is kaput. Uh, maybe it's time to start scrambling. And and that's what you end up typically. Uh, and, and then again, don't discount a PC death because of a, a, a rash or a bad decision. That gnome that wants to jump across the Grand Canyon, um, unless they got something to make them go 
you know, fly or, or a big rocket strapped to their back. I, you know, maybe have that discussion before they actually take that final leap and then maybe let them come to a skidding halt at the edge of the canyon, uh, a la Bugs Bunny or whatever the case may be. So how do you encourage children to come up with creative solutions within the framework of the game's rules as much as possible? Of course, you, the, the framework, I think, is the important word there. And, and that was part of the discussion we talked about earlier is is kind of like teasing out those ideas where, OK, when I create an adventure and, and, a, and an adventure module where I've got the different nodes where we want to go and do something here that leads to the A, leads to B, leads to C, which maybe have a, has a branch off to D, whatever that looks like, um, I, I have what I would envision most players would do. Kids, kids will come up with some weird and wacky ideas and, and necessarily maybe you want to skip all the way to D. And, and you have to be ready to, to, to allow for that to happen. And that, that starts more in adventure design than it does in necessarily dealing with it as it happens. Um, you, you, you can't create an adventure so rigid that you railroad what you expect from somebody who doesn't even understand the concept of being railroaded down an adventure. Or expect somebody to act like every adult would act. And <laughs> see, exactly. we're talking kids here, right? Exactly. So... I, I allow max flex in terms of the way things work. And then again, uh, I lace in the clues and I lace in the, uh, you know, sometimes blatantly. Uh, and then sometimes I give that that NPC that just comes out of nowhere and be like, oh, there you guys are. I just thought of something. This is a clue, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and again, it depends on the maturity and the, 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 uh, the, the level of immersion that you got from your, from your players. There's a variety okay. of things. All right, well, let's jump down to Nagahide. i uh, going to ask you the question, how do you balance rules enforcement with flexibility to maintain fun and engagement? And you are muted. There, there we, we go. go. Now you can hear me. Uh, I play very loose with the rules, especially the younger they are. Um, for example, when I started, when when I start with riffs and I'm playing riffs, uh, I adjust the combat to be about as simple as D and D five E can be. Uh, I essentially remove the number of attacks. And just allowed parry and dodge as reactions to being attacked. You know, if they're in a melee combat, they can parry. If they're in a firefight, they can dodge. And then this um, is particularly for uh, when you're running for, games for new people and kids, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Only for kids, not for new people, just <laughs> kids. Fair enough. Because adults, okay. you're gonna learn you're gonna learn the hard way if you're an adult. Yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then depending on, depending on the age of the child, like for my daughter, when she started, cause she started way younger than my son, I wouldn't have her roll every time she wanted to perform a skill. Sometimes I would say, okay, you're going to, you're going to try and do that. And then I, behind the game master screen would roll percentile dice and just kind of look down and okay, you were, you were unsuccessful in, in, in your attempt. Uh, what else would you like to try? You know, but generally I, I try to just play the game and let them enjoy being their character. And if it goes clown shoes, it goes clown shoes. I don't care. Gonzo's so what strategies? Well, what strategies do you do in that case to, to keep the game moving smoothly without strict adherence to every rule? So that str I don't use a strategy. I, I wing it. I don't, when I, well, I mean, when I'm is, running that's a, its own strategy, <laughs> I guess you could. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I totally wing it. I play when I'm playing any, any game where young kids are involved, it's, it's totally off the cuff. I, I, I have a general concept 
I mean, as general as it can be, like bad guys robbing a train and they have to stop them or there's uh, the Foot Clan is in New York and you got to find them and defeat them. Teenage and then I just Ninja Turtles. Oh, right. sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I just, that's how it starts. Okay. And they just kind of, and, and that, that's, that's fair. I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot with this. I'm just, you know, as a video that's uh, out there for people to get ideas from, Hey, and uh, an idea is be flexible and wing it, whatever comes to your mind, how you think a situation could resolve itself based on what the kids are trying and what the diet roles indicate, just go with it. Kind of like what every game master does on the adult side. You can do that on the kid's side. Just know that you're going right. to have a wider gamut of crazy that's going to come out of that. But that's cool because that's you're dealing with children here. Right. Okay. All right. Lauren Mattias, how do you balance rules enforcement with flexibility to maintain fun and engagement? Um, well, I'm going to basically uh, agree with uh, everything Frank said. And I think Naga Hyde hit it the nail on the head when he said, let kids be kids. Um, I, again, like I, I just thought about what I was going to be dealing with and which was going to be children. And uh, because I'm trying to use this as a learning experience as well, um, you know, rules is written, I think is a good, um, I guess, principle to, teach and instruct the next generation of gamers so i purposely chose a game that was awfully rules light and would be easy to apply shadow dark so um I, it's already flexible so i am playing by the rules when i'm just like hey just tell me what you want to do just tell me what you'd want to do and i'll tell you to make a strength check or a dex check i'll tell you whether you have advantage or disadvantage and we're using this optional rule of luck dice so you get a re-roll when you feel like it or or you can be a team player and use it on somebody else's um uh uh, uh role or whatever um so um the keep on the borderlands campaign uh, that flexibility was baked in when i sat down and said okay i'm going to do a dungeons and dads thing what system and I, I i i was tempted to use the rule cyclopedia because I, I really like that rule set um but i remember when i tried to sh- explain thaco to my son granted he was six at the time <laughs> he's like what doesn't oh, rule cyclopedia use the combat matrix so i thought it was just a chart am, uh, I, am I mistaken it, on that one no there is a chart but it, um it it translates to thaco a little bit oh, okay but, yeah um so uh yeah so basically yeah he didn't he didn't like it and i just like why why make it challenging when he can like figure this stuff out later yeah. you know what i mean okay. so and again wanting to keep things flexible uh shadow dark was perfect and um and yeah it's been kind of i don't want to say easy but um i haven't ran, run into any situation where i'm like forced to make a decision like well the rules say this but the kid really wants to do this other thing you know um and as far as winging it i'm when i play sandboxes i'm kind of a zero prep guy anyway so and i i don't worry about it um they have the keep they have the caves of chaos i populated the map with a few extra little mini dungeons so they have more variety more choices to make they know they have to hunt around for rumors and they go and they do it um and when they say okay we're gonna they come up with some wacky plan to take on the uh bandits okay let's see what happens you know and we start rolling dice like i'm 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 shocked that they survived uh actually taking on the bandits based on their insane plan um they were rolling hot that night so so how do you incorporate educational elements into your games without making it feel like schoolwork Oh, well, I, I, well, when my son was four and we were doing like the really super simple, you know, I, I made him do all the math and I'm like, what's 15 plus three, go ahead, count it out, you know? Um, and, uh, the, I think I mentioned this before, uh, he had to unlock a magic door by writing the magic runes of his name, you know, and he, he did it, you know, um, for the keep on the borderlands game that's more i guess higher order sort of things that i want them to sort of walk away with the team aspect the creativity 
um, the uh, understanding, you know, um, consequences in particular. Um, yeah, that's the big okay. one. Like, I, I really want to make sure people understand that there are consequences to your actions. And hopefully that translates outside of the game when they're out in the world, you know. I learned how to build a doghouse by playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything that you guys wanted to talk to each other about in terms of anything that was said? Uh, again, this doesn't have to be a complete lecture mode. You guys can chat with each other as well uh, during this point. If there's anything you want to clarify, uh, else we can start moving on to the next segment. All right. Sounds good. Uh, the next segment is going to be engaging storytelling and creativity. So we're trying to we're trying to get into the brains of the youngins and uh, bring out their storytelling and their creativity. Uh, super chats. I don't think we got any super chats this time around. Do do do. We did not. But uh, Rex Steel says kids are the perfect players for sandbox games. I can see that. I can. They're not jaded by life's <laughs> rules and and boundaries and so forth. They're just gonna go do wackadoodle stuff the kids do, and uh, you can definitely tell if uh if something. Why did I start, crafty? I started your comment. Why isn't it on here? Hold on. Because crafty had a comment that followed that one right up that I thought was hilarious. If I can quickly find it. Uh oh. Along with the cats. <laughs> No, it's this one right here. So I wrote in it. I wrote a module, which, by the way, don't buy the module. It is. I've got a. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote it. Apparently, I didn't know English when I wrote it. Um, but it's, it needs some fixes. But anyway, uh, yeah. See, uh, caving in the minotaur. Uh, caving in the minotaur is a perfectly viable option. So in in that module, you fight a minotaur. It's for Forbidden Lands. Uh, you, you fight a minotaur or two, and instead of defeating it the old fashioned way. <laughs> his group decided to just bring down the ceiling on top of him and walk away. And I'm like, well, that's not how that was supposed to happen. But you know what? That's what happened. It worked out for him, and uh, they won. They won that or defeated that encounter. So imagine if that was children. Oh wait, was his children? Um, get back to over here because I had one more starred. Uh, make you go away. There we go. Uh, TMNT is great with kids, animals. Now, now you're going to get you're going to get into my psychology for a moment here. Um, I despise, in terms of role playing, I despise the cartoon. Now, you're absolutely right. That is absolutely great for kids. It really is. <laughs> which is which is why I don't run games for kids because I can't I can't handle it. No, mine's more like the comic books. Mine is very. You know, look, I watch enough nature shows of the of the cheetah eating, the, you know, catching the rabbit and the lions taking down the wildebeest and so forth. That's how I picture mutant animals, savages. <laughs> so don't let me run TMNT for your kids. But other than that, his comment is right. If you run it like the cartoons, absolutely be a great way to get kids into a uh, into a role playing game. Yeah, that is not one that I could find myself buying into. I, I the mentality of going in there and doing like uh, let's play furries. Um, that <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. I just can't. Neither it's, it's, with my daughter. My daughter absolutely. She like she's got a couple of people that do the furry thing at her school, and she's like, they're kind of crazy. Uh, like I, I don't understand it. I'm like, okay, neither do I. So let's move on. It's fun. It's funny you say that because in the real world, I agree with you. But when it comes to a role playing game, you know, and not not let me flip the script and then we'll move on to the next segment. Is uh, you know, a lot of people love superheroes, but to me, superheroes are just weirdos that wear their underwear outside their freaking spandex. You like, like, I I don't get why people like superheroes. I'm not against them in any way, shape, or form, but they've never been something I latched onto. But a, some a nine foot tall bipedal bear that's holding a gun and can rip your throat out with a, with his jaw. That yeah, that's awesome. You know, I, I you know tomato tomato. You know, people one you know, people like one way, one people you know set of people like the other way. So I do get that. I do get the idea that not everybody likes the mutant animals. The furry reference, though, I think I take a little bit of offense yeah. to that because I got I get nailed hard on that anytime we cover. Uh, cover team and I've actually lost some longtime viewers. Oh, I didn't know this was gonna be a furry channel. Over covering. Uh, uh, after the bomb, <laughs> like really, yeah, that's weird. That, that surprises me too. 
you can go look in the comments of those old videos. You'll see, uh, I think you'll see a few of them in there. Uh, I mean, anyway. in all honesty, what, whatever gets people playing uh, uh, dicing at a table, I mean, in all honesty, if, if it's not for me, or, or in that case, my daughter will find another table, or I will start another table and we will play. Oh, right. that's, that's just how it works. And, and for kids, all the power to those that can go that route. All right, uh, let me finish this up here by hitting the right button. Apparently, I forgot how to stream. There we go. All right, well, the charity we support is the Wounded Warrior Project, a national nonpartisan organization. I'm going to just put that on the screen. How about that? National nonpartisan organization whose mission is to honor and empower wounded warriors. Please refer to the video's description for the link to where you can make your, hopefully, for Americans, tax-deductible donation. And if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video and subscribe to all of the panelists' channels and blogs, et cetera, et cetera, which you can find in the description.